I want to welcome all of you here today, the many men and women of the Justice Department who are here, members of the executive and judicial and executive branches, um, leaders from law enforcement, from civil rights organizations, and from bar associations. Your collective presence here today is really a tribute to the admiration and respect that Attorney General Lynch inspires. I also want to recognize the many friends and family members of the Attorney Generals who have traveled here really from all over the country. I probably should tell you you could sit down now if you'd like that. <laughs> It was going to be a long program if you all were standing for the entire time. So, I want to, th as I said, uh, welcome the many friends and family members of the Attorney Generals who have traveled from all over the country, from New York and Georgia and North Carolina and here in the greater D.C. area, and want to give a special welcome to the Attorney General's immediate family. Her husband, Stephen Hargrove, and their children, Kia and Ryan, her brother, Leonzo, her parents, Lorenzo and her mother, Lorene, and uh, Leonzo's wife, Nicole. We really want to thank them all for being here for this very special occasion. Now, while today is the Attorney General's formal swearing in, you all know that she's been on the job for over six weeks now and she's already begun to build a legacy. Whether it was dealing with the events in Baltimore literally hours after arriving at the Department of Justice, or announcing charges in a sprawling international corruption scandal that has garnered worldwide attention, she has quickly established herself as someone who will lead this department with vigor and determination. I first got to know our Attorney General back when she and I served on Attorney General Holder's advisory committee. And even though she was in Brooklyn and I was in Atlanta, we shared a common professional background of being career prosecutors who cared deeply about the Department of Justice. I was struck then by her steadfast resolve on the one hand and her unfailing graciousness on the other. I was also struck by the values that I now witness on a daily basis, her integrity, her sense of duty, and her commitment to doing things the right way. These traits that were instilled by her family and developed over her years as a career prosecutor reflect the very best of what this department is all about. Attorney General Lynch assumes her new responsibilities at a great moment in our department's history. Over the past six years, the Department of Justice has flourished under the leadership of our friend, Attorney General Holder, a man who fought tirelessly for the cause of justice and who never shrank from holding our department to its ideals. And while we are... But while we are stronger than ever, we're no doubt going to face challenges in the months to come. But I'm confident that whatever the task, whether it's ensuring our national security, fighting cybercrime, or preserving civil rights and public safety while deepening the relationship between law enforcement and the communities that we serve, I'm confident that we have the right woman for the job. So let me be the first of many today to congratulate our new Attorney General and to say how lucky we are to have her at the helm. And with that, let's begin today's celebration with the presentation of the colors.
In the early 1960s, Reverend Lorenzo Lynch, a dynamic Baptist minister from Durham, North Carolina, traveled the South participating in revival services. At the time, Jim Crow laws prevented him from staying in motels, so he frequently stayed in the homes of family members. As a child, Shawnee Ball recalls Reverend Lynch spending a week in her family's home while he participated in a revival service in Winton, North Carolina. Shawnee also vividly recalls how the whole congregation responded to his eloquent and moving sermons. Shawnee grew up, joined the Justice Department, and now serves as a paralegal in our antitrust division. And the Reverend's daughter is now our 83rd Attorney General. I now introduce Shawnee Ball to sing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled I'd like to ask the students from Bedford Academy High School to return to the stage so they can lead us all in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> As they come to the stage, let me tell you a little bit about this group. In 2010, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York, Attorney General Lynch's office, developed a partnership with Bedford Academy High School, which is a public school in Brooklyn. It's a public school where more than 90% of the students graduate and go on to college. Over the past five years, 27 students at Bedford Academy have participated in the U.S. Attorney's Office pre-law program there, and Attorney General Lynch has mentored a number of students and spoke at the school's 2012 graduation. I'm delighted to introduce a group of students here from Bedford Academy who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We are fortunate to have today Reverend Clarence Newsom to offer today's invocation. Dr. Newsom, who now serves as the president of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, has known the Attorney General for more than 40 years. 
Dr. Newsom and the Attorney General's father have been colleagues in the ministry since the 1970s. And while at Duke Divinity School, Dr. Newsom taught the Attorney General's brother. Most recently, in January of this year, Dr. Newsom traveled to Washington to testify on the Attorney General's behalf. And we are honored that he has returned to Washington today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Reverend Dr. Clarence Newsom. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose presence makes sacred this solemn assembly, we humbly beseech you to make yourself felt at this time and in this place through our desire and intention to offer thanksgiving for the blessings of life that have brought us to this hallowed moment. Consecrate these proceedings, we pray, and so that we will be moved by the power of your goodness to acknowledge the guidance of your wisdom and the work of your hand in the appointment of the Honorable Loretta Elizabeth Lynch as the 83rd Attorney General of the United States. So cover her with your effectual grace and continuing favor that a grateful nation will see in the discharge of her duties a person so committed to the rule of law that by subjecting herself to the law of love, none need fear living with injustice. That by dedicating herself to establishing and ensuring equal protection of the law, there will be equal opportunities for all in our bountiful land to live into the fullness of their humanity. O oh God, let your presence not only illumine the historic nature of her appointment, but the timeless truth that when a nation under God commits and dedicates itself to justice with righteousness, order with peace will prevail. And now, in the embrace of your compassion and care, we in the company of your never-ending presence especially commend her to your safekeeping and uplifting and all of us, our president, all elected officials, all appointed officials, all the citizens of these United States to your mercy and joy in your creation. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Newsom. Please be seated. Now joining us on the stage will be the Morgan State University Choir. This nationally acclaimed choir that hails from one of our nation's great historically black colleges has performed around the world, from the East Room of the White House to the concert halls of Australia, China, and South Africa. They've come down from Baltimore to perform two songs for us today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Morgan State Choir. God bless. 
Please welcome Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor, Mr. Stephen Hargrove, Reverend Lorenzo Lynch, and Mrs. Loreen Lynch. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the United States and Attorney General Loretta Lynch. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Everybody, please have a seat. I was telling Loretta backstage, a little pomp and circumstance never hurts. <laughs> Justice Sonia Sotomayor is here. I want to congratulate Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates on her confirmation. She was here somewhere. There she is. Uh, and I want to thank the elected officials who are here today, uh, the family and the friends, the colleagues. Uh, at long last, I'm so proud to be here for the installation of our 83rd Attorney General of the United States, Loretta Lynch. Uh, we want to welcome Loretta's family, uh, her husband, uh, Stephen Hargrove, Her father, Reverend Lorenzo Lynch. Uh, we want to say uh, to Ms. Lynch as well, thank you so much for your appearance. As I said when I nominated Loretta, uh, in a country built on the rule of law, there are few, perhaps no, offices more important than that of Attorney General. The person in this position is the American people's lawyer, tasked with enforcing our federal laws and making sure they're applied evenly and equally. And that's the legacy of Eric Holder. Uh, we are grateful for his outstanding service. as one of the longest serving attorney generals in our history. Uh, and I want to thank his wonderful wife, Dr. Sharon Malone, who's here today. Where's Sharon at? There she is. As attorney general, Eric was driven by his fundamental belief that justice is not an abstraction. Uh, it's a very real and tangible way that our laws interact with people in their daily lives. And the good news is Loretta shares that belief. She brings her own unique style of leadership. Uh, she brings a wealth of experience to the Justice Department at a time when there is so much work to be done, from keeping us safe from terrorist attacks, to protecting our financial system, to safeguarding our environment, to upholding civil rights. And all of you at the Justice Department, public servants who do incredible work day in, day out, could not ask for a better leader. Many of you know Loretta's story 
uh, born in segregated Greensboro, North Carolina. Loretta was raised by a fourth generation Baptist minister and a school librarian, uh, both of whom don't seem to mind speaking their minds. <laughs> That's just my quick impression. <laughs> and more importantly, taught Loretta the value of speaking up for what's right. As a young girl, she'd go to the Durham courthouse with her father and watch court proceedings. And he'd tell her stories about her grandfather who risked everything to protect black people who found themselves caught up with the law but had almost no recourse under Jim Crow. And he did this with only a third grade education, proving to Loretta that no matter what our circumstances, we all have the power to make a difference in the lives of others. So it's clear that both her parents had a huge influence on Loretta. They are her biggest cheerleaders. Uh, apparently, when she applied to work at the U.S. Attorney's Office and an FBI agent went to their house to conduct a routine background check, her parents pulled out a bunch of scrapbooks of Loretta's accomplishments, <laughs> made, made the agents look through them. <laughs> I'm sure Loretta was mortified. <laughs> yeah. And here in third grade, she got the prize. And here's one of her old poems. I just picture the FBI agent sitting there, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so the, the agent later told Loretta that she probably wasn't a threat to America because if she were, her parents would have documented it in some way. <laughs> That's something I can appreciate as a father. Uh, so Loretta seized the opportunities that her family gave her uh, to build a distinguished life in public service. After Harvard College and Harvard Law School, she rose to become a strong independent prosecutor. Loretta spent years in the trenches battling terrorism and financial fraud and cybercrime. She went from the Assistant U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York to Chief of the Long Island Office, Chief Assistant U.S. Attorney. Long Island in the house. <laughs> and then U.S. Attorney. Uh, she chased public corruption. She helped secure billions in settlements from some of the world's biggest banks accused of fraud. She jailed some of New York's most notorious and violent mobsters and gang members. She pursued some of the world's most dangerous terrorists and cyber criminals. The law is her map, justice her compass. She is tough, but she is fair. She is firm, but kind. Her intelligence and her judgment, her grace under fire, have earned the trust and admiration of those she works with and those she serves, uh, and even those she goes up against. In fact, it's funny that we are installing Loretta today. It's not like she's been waiting around to, you know, for the you know, embossed invitation. Uh, she hit the ground running from day one. Uh, she's already made her mark here at home and abroad because of her laser focus on the core mission of the Justice Department, the protection of the American people. And she understands the importance of policing and improving relationships between law enforcement and communities. She went on a six-city tour to spotlight the challenges in community policing and the progress that's being made. She understands the importance of criminal justice reform that we have to be smart on crime, not just tough. That's why she's committed to working as a partner to, uh, to leaders with both parties who want to pursue reform that continues the trend of a falling crime rate and a falling incarceration rate. She understands the importance of protecting our national security while also securing our civil liberties. That's why she will safeguard the programs that are critical to protecting American lives uh, and Americans' privacy. I see our FBI director, uh, Jim Comey, who's here, and I know he's committed to doing the same thing. She lives out the words of one of our greatest attorney generals, Robert F. Kennedy. The glory of justice and the majesty of the law are created not just by the Constitution, nor by the courts, nor by the officers of the law, nor by the lawyers, but by the men and women who constitute our society who are protectors of the law, 
as they are themselves protected by the law. That's always been the story of our nation. Our strength does not come from the words we've written on the page or the laws we've put down on the books. It comes from ordinary citizens, generation after generation, who do their part to uphold our founding ideals. It comes from an unshakable faith in our ability to stand up for what is right and to admit where we've fallen short and then choose a better way forward. That was the cause to which Loretta dedicated her life long before she became America's top law enforcement officer. Today, the American people can have no greater advocate for their right to equality under the law, no greater partner in securing justice for all than our Attorney General, Loretta Lynch. General, to be very soon, Loretta Elizabeth Lynch. Please place your left hand on the Bible. That is the Bible of Frederick Douglass. And so you have a great honor to uphold. And raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Loretta Elizabeth Lynch. I, Loretta Elizabeth Lynch. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. On which I am about to enter. On which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. <laughs> Well, <laughs> oh, um, so much to say, so many people who mean so much to me. Everyone here means something very special to me, and I thank you all. Mr. President, thank you so much for your words and your presence here today. To say that my heart is full is such an understatement, but one does not get to this place to this department, to this theater or this podium alone, and I'm no different. I owe thanks to so many whom I'm so pleased to be able to acknowledge here today. Mr. President, thank you for your faith in asking me to lead the department that is the conscience of this nation, that represents more than any other the fundamental promise of America of equal justice under the law. Thank you, sir.
Justice Sotomayor, thank you for your support here today and over the years. You are an inspiration, not just to me, but to countless young women who see in you a dream made possible. Thank you so much. Thanks also to my good friend and colleague, the Deputy Attorney General, Sally Yates. She is an exemplary colleague. More than that, she's a true friend. Since our days as U.S. attorneys together, it's an honor to lead this department with you, Sally, and I thank you. Thanks to all of you who came here today, exceptional public servants, distinguished guests, extraordinary leaders, remarkable friends. Your strength and your kindness have paved the way for all that I've been able to achieve, and I thank you. And thanks also to those without whom this day truly would not have happened. All of those who, from so many affiliations, worked so hard on my behalf on the road to my confirmation. You harnessed the spirit of public service, the spirit of civic contribution, as well as the spirit of sisterhood to make this dream come to fruition. <laughs> I thank you all today from the bottom of my heart, not just for your presence here today, but in my life and on this journey. And of course, I must also thank my family for their steadfast support, not only over the last several months, but always. My father, Lorenzo, who never fails to match his principles with action, taught me to think for myself and to serve others. My mother, Lorene, instilled in me a love of learning. While her faith that a more just society was possible made me imagine a world without limits, a dedicated young minister who carried me on his shoulders to watch those not much older than I make history, and a courageous young teacher who refused to let Jim Crow or anyone define her. Their commitment to justice and to public service has been the inspiration for my life's work. And it is why I dedicate this day, this event, and this achievement to them. I must also thank my husband, Steve, my life's partner and my fearless champion, who has never wavered in his support for my dreams, and when faced with a choice, has always, always urged me to fly. And of course, I have to thank all my colleagues, my friends at the Department of Justice for your ongoing faith in me and for giving me the opportunity to work for you as we go forth to implement the laws that set us free and bind us together as a nation. I would not have anyone else by my side as we work to preserve our national security and our cherished liberties, to make safe the world of cyberspace, to end the scourge of modern day slavery, and as we confront the very nature of our citizens' relationship with those of us entrusted to protect and to serve. These are indeed challenging issues and challenging times. Even as our world has expanded in wonderful ways, the threats that we face have evolved in measures commensurate. And every day, we seem to see an increasing disconnect between the communities we serve and the government we represent. We see all these things. But let me tell you what else I see. I see people speaking out in the time-honored tradition that has made this country stronger. In their cries for justice, I hear the belief that it can be attained. And they would not cry out if they did not have faith that we would answer. I see more. In our law enforcement partners' quest for support, I hear the Guardian's call for tools to calm the waters, to keep the peace, and to comfort those who fear. Yes, we have great challenges. But our strength as Americans is to turn our great challenges into great opportunities. Many of our greatest advances in equal rights, in human rights, have come after periods of heartbreaking loss. 
but they come because we choose not to give in to the twin pulls of revenge and retribution, but we turn to the law. And sometimes we forget that this has never been easy. You see, over 200 years ago, we decided what kind of a country we wanted to be. And we have not always lived up to the promises made, but we have pushed ever on. And with every challenge, we get a little bit closer. We have held the truth of the equality of all men to be self-evident. We have fought to maintain a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And we have followed a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. And at every turn, when struggles threaten to tear us apart, we turn to the law to reconnect ourselves with our highest principles, to give voice to those fighting oppression, to give hope to those seeking the redress of wrongs, to give meaning to the cry of never again, and to protect those who call on us in the still, small hours of the night when they are cold and frightened. These are our values. These are our beliefs. And when we hold on to them, we do great things. And what we have learned from all of our challenges is not that our values are not true and good, but that every generation must commit to them and work to make them real for the challenges of their time, that the price of freedom is constant vigilance. This is how we have succeeded as a country, and this is how we will meet these challenges today. And if the arc of the moral universe does indeed bend toward justice, as I believe that it does, it takes all hearts and all hands to keep its path straight and true. My friends, I stand before you today having been blessed beyond compare. But to whom much is given, much is required. And so, I make these pledges to you here today. Mr. President, I pledge to you to lead this Department of Justice with integrity, with honor, and a total dedication to the cause of justice. To the people of this great nation, I pledge to you that your protection your liberties and your rights will be my sacred charge. To the law enforcement community, I pledge that this department will be your partner as we work to carry out our highest mission, the protection of the people of this great nation. And to all my colleagues in this wonderful Department of Justice, I pledge to always remember that the place of justice is a hallowed place and continually strive to be worthy of the trust that you have placed in me as we work together to uphold the Constitution, to protect the American people, and to serve the cause of justice. And to my family, my wonderful family, I pledge to strive to continue to live up to the examples that you have set. I make these pledges to and before you all upon the oath that I have taken and the honor that I hold dear. To everyone here in this room, thank you again for the trust that you have reposed in me for your faith and your confidence in me, and thank you for sharing this wonderful day with me. Thank you all.